first technique we briefly discussed this even yesterday right take of completion we will write it down so mathematical modeling is the first way to analyze understand the performance of a given system and the second is simulation again there is analog simulation discrete simulation today we talk mostly about computer based simulation and in particular we will talk about discrete event simulation and then of course right the third aspect is to implement right implementation based So, the book actually calls this simply measurement, but we do measurement in any whether it is simulation also we measure. Um, so, therefore, I have simply added this term implementation you basically implement it in a real system right this is a practical implementation. For example, some cache coherence protocol that you have come up with you should be able to you can do analysis simulation or mathematical modeling right. And we sometimes also use the term right analytical modeling here. So, if you have uh, taken ADSA or, D or DSA right or data structures algorithms probably have done some of these things right in your labs. So, you have done in class you have done your theoretical analysis of the algorithms then we do probably do not did not do this you simply went straight away to implementation because it was mostly right straightforward algorithms not a complex system which you are trying to uh, simulate okay. <coughs> and then implementation, but measurements you probably you know maybe a couple of values of sizes of the list, but mostly wor mostly worried about correctness right functionality is what you worried about than scalability of the system itself ok. So, we will talk a little bit about um, the nature or the type kind of task that is involved in a mathematical modeling system ok. So, what comes to mind right what are the different things involved and is it hard easy time consuming accurate right reflect on all those things let me know which is So, is math modeling easy or hard? It is hard. Hard, right? It is interesting because only now we start kind of going away from math modeling. Anytime somebody builds a system, either you implement it or simulate it and then you are done. Nobody really wants to go to the analytical product. But 20, 30 years ago, right, this was not a real option. Computer based simulations were not really around. If you look at a lot of the early papers in um, even networks, right, I will use that as an example most of the early papers were trying to do some sort of math modeling right. You had to have a math model if you had to have a good paper, but then that is not the end of it. Somebody actually has to build the system right. Why was TCP IP successful? Because somebody built it made it part of BST and made it available to everybody right. So, it was mostly these two were the traditional options in those days for researchers. Now, this is harder if I suddenly tell you go build a wide area network and test your routing protocols on that you simply cannot do that right even now it is hard even today we will see if we have seen cloud computing based experiments right is it I have devised this new algorithm for allocating resources on the cloud and then ok where is your cloud I have four machines on a LAN right that is my cloud that is not a cloud where did you emulate the cloud right you should actually have you know accounts elsewhere or put your machines elsewhere and somehow access that. So, uh, implementation has always been hard but this is always been easy. So, if you look at lot of the early work in computer systems and so on they really depended upon mathematical modeling right, but today we are sort of you know veering away from that because we know that there is an option. Otherwise, you could have simply proposed an algorithm and said I am done you would not be able to finish your work and go anyway right. So, either you implement it or you analyze it. So, <coughs> so therefore, this is I would say harder right. So, the skill set involved is you need to have some knowledge of several math techniques right. <coughs> we are going to see only some of those in this class, 
um, Markov chains, models and so on, but there is a wide right, variety of uh, analysis techniques, modeling techniques that are there and what usually what we do is we have one tool, I know Markov chains, therefore everything is a Markov chain, right. Whatever system you give me is a Markov chain, I simply draw a Markov chain for everything. <coughs> so, we have to be willing to right, go beyond, even I have stopped, I did not go beyond Markov and semi Markov, but uh, those that is why you have a class of researchers that try to keep on coming with new techniques, right. Those are the performance evaluation researchers, there are people try to come up with new math models and those who try to use them and show us how to use them. And then once somebody shows how to use them, we simply use that same model over and over again, right. This classic example is in the case of uh, like optical networks, there is this, uh, you know, traffic requests come in, light paths come in, they get established or you know, they won't get established. So, there is a way to calculate the blocking probability. So, the blocking probability most of us are initially doing simulation based, right, simulation, simulate and then show the results or do an ILP, integer linear programming formulation, this is a design problem, right, what is the performance of the system or how do you design the light paths and so on. And um, then I guess in 99, 2000 a paper came along that showed how to do blocking probability computation, it was fairly intricate, uh, you know, the probability and statistic, uh, probability. Uh, used to actually do this cal calculation. So, once they did that, then that became the, 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 the tradition. Everybody else would simply use that same model and start computing things the same way, right. So, now and then people come and show you how things can be done differently, but otherwise we stick to our so known set of tools, right, and then keep using that over and over again. So, this, uh, the right, the skill set, right, is purely mathematical, right, and uh, if you go to a math School, they will say that this is no big deal, we do this all the time. When we come to computer science, we will say, well, we can do some of it, but not all of it, right. <coughs> so, so, skills get required is, you know, purely mathematical. But what else? What other features, right? Is it good? Is it bad? So, we said it is hard. Okay, forget it. Let us say you have to do math model. I said nothing doing, right. Without that, you cannot get your PhD. Usually for PhD students, we insist on that, right, that you better do a math model of your system. Otherwise, there is no rigor. Why does math model help you? Sometimes the math modeling helps you abstract the system away, right. You are looking at the system at a very high level, not at a detailed level. Detail level worry about all the variables, all the files that you have to include, right, at the level of implementation. Sometimes that is irrelevant. You really want to abstract the system away at a very high level. So, it gives you a bird's eye view of the system, right. So, that is a good point about it. So, you have a very high level. of the system. Uh, what do you mean by high level? You are, let us say you are looking at uh, queuing, uh, scheduling algorithm, right, in an operating system and you have this multi-level feedback queue, if you remember M, right, where you start off with some uh, very low quantum, then you keep jumping to different queues and so on, right. And then you go to I O queues also, right, you have the CPU queue, you go to some I O queue and so on. Now, if you look at it from a real system point of view, you will start worrying about how do I build these queues, should I use linked list, doubly linked list and all that stuff. Here, if I look at it as a math model, you want to know what is the throughput of the system, how many jobs, right, per unit time can the system complete. You simply view the system as a collection of networks of queues. It is simply a set of queues and that is about it. You do not worry about all the lower level details of implementation. So, doing math problem, we will not be putting in various variables or various parameters. Yes, so that is true. Something. Yeah, that is why it is a very abstract model which is good to start with. You do not worry about the details initially, because you first you want to get an approximate understanding of the behavior of the system. To get the approximate behavior, you start with a very, um, I would say gross abstraction, not a detailed abstraction, right. But you may have certain some gaps where you actually try to abstract something which, uh, True. your approximations could go wrong. At yes, the yeah. so that is why this is a starting point. So, mostly they use this as a starting point, right. Even we talked about sorting too, you have two different algorithms, both of them saying n log n, which is better, right. Why do people use quicksort all the time? You tell me, why is quicksort used more often, right. Quicksort is used most, more often than the others, even though there are others. Merge sort is also n log n, right. Why is quicksort used more often? Yeah, so the, that, how did you know that? That is either you do analysis or you can also verify that empirically, right. So, you have both verifications to do. But you knew that I do not want to look at n squared algorithms. Right, this eliminates the n square algorithm space. All those naive algorithms are gone. Right, so therefore you you this helps you narrow down to a set of uh, prob most probable systems or techniques to use. So that is that loss is there. So that is why you're you lose. So this very high level abstraction is both a positive and a negative. 
positive is that it lets you focus on the main characteristics not on the details, but sometimes details are also important. So, you lose the details which you have to capture with the next level which is simulation based systems and so on right. <coughs> so, this very high level abstract right makes lots of assumptions. So, you assume right you will always say assume that and then you say you let us say I want you to find out what is the average delay of customers coming to this state bank or some bank right teller and either you sit there daily and measure 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 or if somebody tells you that ok I sat there for an hour I think about 10 customers per hour came right ok good. What is the average service time per customer I mean ok well, about 5 to 5 minutes per customer is the average I saw for this 1 hour. Then you would say ok tell me what is the average delay right. So, you can simply go to a system with a known closed form solution which is say MM1 or MG1 and so on right. If you make those assumptions you first of all say that I assume that the arrival process coming to this queue is poison right. Nobody ever verify that it is poison it could need not be poison, but that is a convenient assumption you make because there are closed form solutions right. So, wherever you find convenient assumptions about the system right characterization you simply take those simply to get your closed form solutions right. So, therefore, uh, that need not be holding true with what your actual system is nobody even knows whether it is Poisson or not right. We just say that well conveniently will assume that it is Poisson many things you simply assume Poisson. The networks there was a long fight right people said no calls are no longer Poisson it is right something else it is Marco modulated Poisson right or a self similar traffic all those things came about. But fundamentally if I want just tell me approximately what the delay will be right should I put 10 servers or 20 servers. Now for that sometimes MM1 is good enough right your basic queuing models are good enough. So, you start from there and then you start going into more detail. So, you do make a lot of assumptions right which does not fully represent the system behavior. So, that is a negative <coughs> and um, so that is also because of that your results are also not accurate right. Your results are only asymptotic results many times it gives you sometimes it is accurate if you really system is mm1 you will verify this if I really simulate an exponential arrival and an exponential or a poison arrival and exponential distribution time you will get those closed form solutions right you actually you simulate those you can verify that. But the question is whether the system really behaves with those kind of assumptions right. So, the results are mostly right so, the results are asymptotic right not very accurate. So, loss of accuracy is there because we know assumptions are there, but what else? Comes to mind with math, mod, with uh, math modeling. You may not be able to get very detailed performance result. Yes. Yes, outliers may not be captured. Yes. So you may not be able to. Uh, yeah. Some of those things that we saw many times when you look at this math plot, there are simple equations. You simply plot them and say here is a nice smooth curve, right? And um, for example, right, you are actually trying to plot the inter arrival times right of uh, packets coming to a system. If I have an exponential model, it will be simply something like this right. This is the probability let us say you are capturing the probability of actually packets coming to the system it will be something of this. So, packets of length this have uh, right we actually we do a CDF, but uh, let us say that this is some sort of curve that represents right something that your probability of something that you are measuring. So, this would be your math model that says this is the expected probability for these various things, but realistically your points might fall right all over the place there could be one guy there could be one guy here and so on. I could run simulation right with different values on the x axis and I find that this is actually what I am getting by simulation by experimentation. So, yeah those outliers are lost. So, some detailed analysis is not there right that is another disadvantage. <coughs> and also if I want to look at um, say per user throughput let us look at aloha as a classic example right. If I use um, I can let us say throughput of aloha right. I can simply represent by this formula g is the offered load and e power minus g. So, e is your e right that we know from math and uh, so this is the offered load in terms of packets per second and this is the actual realized throughput by the system. This is a very simple this is good enough for me to know that my so what will be if I plot this curve right what will it look like 
So, this is G the load that we talked about right this is load on this axis right and this is the throughput measured on this axis. What will it look like? You can verify right increase and decrease. And the maximum again you can find out right differentiate this you find max when z equals 1 which is therefore, the maximum throughput is 1 over e and that is 0 0.368 and so on right. This is your 0 0.36 that is 0 0.9 g equals 1. So, beyond offer load of 1 which means if I offer more than 1 packet per second across all the user this is cumulative load offered by all the users of our Aloha system. If I do that then the system starts dipping right. So, this is what I would get from a mathematical model. If I suddenly ask you okay, this is total throughput how about the each user is throughput right. See what can happen in Aloha and, and other cases too you have the so called capture right. I am interested in what is the throughput seen by each of the 50 users in the system across this entire simulation or this you know, some time span. You might find there are problems with that right. It is possible that one user has pretty much hogged the channel and got all the throughput others have not got any throughput. If I simply list the throughput seen by the different users one will be very high others could be very very low right. If I just plot the throughput per user on the graph. Now, that kind of detail I will not get from a math model. If I really want to see per user throughput that is lost. Sometimes you know you won't you won't be able to see this capture effect in a mathematical model like this. So that uh, accuracy is gone. Or if I want to say what if I vary the load per user, right? Some users are 0.25 packets per second, some are 0.5, some are 0.8, and so on. What will be the system behavior? In mathematical model will say well can't do anything about that. I only have this one formula, right? I'll simply keep you give me value of g, I'll plot this curve for you. That's about it. So that again is lost it is not really possible unless you do even more intricate modeling right. So, you sometimes just have this very high level picture right. it simply tells you at a like I said you know, birds a view where the scheme will perform better or worse some some of the other systems ok. So, that uh, detailed right asymptotic not very accurate some of these things are also captured right outliers are lost very graph or very fine level details within the simulation which you can measure very fine measurements cannot be done right and let us say what is the variance if I say what is the variance of delay for a particular packet right for each user's delay what is the variance that you may not be able to get from this particular analysis ok. So, that is a, a general characterization of what math modeling does, but we always usually like to start with math models because you it gets you <coughs> to think about the system right little bit more rigorously. You try to model a system you find that your as some rigor is added into your the way you look at the system the way you represent the system the way you define the system and so on. So, that is a nice part about your math modeling right it adds rigor to your thinking process ok. So, now we come to favorite discrete event simulation So, you all know what simulation is about it is uh, representing a system in the computer using some sort of modeling language right several modeling languages out there. And simulation is not just our computer system it could be even like a nuclear plant simulation you can do that right people do financial simulations right the people do this uh, climate simulation also lots of things they try to do right they said that there will be no all those uh, incorrect uh, some of those predictions happen when you use incorrect simulation models right. So, we will come to that later on, but in general you can capture you define so this uh, represents right. So, this is almost a of the system right. So, you could actually look at your simulation as an exercise that precedes implementation because many times whatever code all the logic that you implement in simulation can be directly imported to if it is a C or if it is hardware then you have to you know, recode and so on, but in general it gives you right. So, you system is modeled as a set of interacting.
So, you view the system as a collection of subsystems, you can implement those subsystems. Within the subsystems, you will have your objects and so on, right. Just like your regular software engineering project where you decompose the system and then uh, identify what the objects are and so on, right. <coughs> and these objects in turn will emulate your system, real system behavior, subcomponent behavior, component behavior, all that will be. And depending on right where you want to draw the line, you have various levels of abstraction possible. So, you can make your system very detailed, you can make your system very a little bit below uh, or a little bit more detailed than analysis, but not very detailed. Okay. <coughs> So, as an example, you are let us say developing a new scheduling algorithm for some wireless network, right. So, you have you can simply focus only on the scheduling part of your system. Simply say I am going to arbitrarily generate requests, they are of these different types and different priorities and here is my scheduling algorithm. I will right just uh, see how my scheduling algorithm allocates slots to these different users based on whatever factors, the amount of traffic you have been allocated so far current priority levels, total request and cost and so on, right, quality of service and things like that. So, that is a very just looking at the scheduling algorithm alone, right, that is that level of abstraction is possible, but then you might say that wait a minute, this is not enough, I really want to see how this works with say TCP and IP running in the system. So, then you have to go and implement above your scheduling algorithm the other network layer protocol stuff, you have to implement IP, TCP or you go to NS2 and just use NS2 or whatever features that it offers. So, you, you can just uh, take use that, right. Then uh, there is one more level of abstraction, you are looking at the layers above in the protocol stack, but then you say you know what there is so much of channel modeling that is needed, right. You say the wireless channel I am simply assuming this to be a pipe that will either drop a packet, right or, or send a packet with some probability that I choose, but I really want to model the channel also, right. Wireless channel could be simply a CSMA channel, right with some of the carrier sensing and all that or it could be even more intricate, right. Well, what kind of fading is there, is it a Rayleigh fading model or some your log normal fading model, right. So, you have to start thinking about even those also start coming to the picture, then you say I have this full end to end system, right. And then if you do simulations and present it, you will be the results will be much more appreciated, okay. So, that is where your varying levels of abstraction come in, but there also comes in with the price, right. This level of uh, too much of detail sometimes, because now your systems have too many subsystems interacting with each other, right. You might suddenly find that no packets are getting through, then you start scratching your head, wait a minute, until only scheduling was there, things were so perfect. Now, I put this wireless channel model, I thought it will work well, but no, no packets are going through. Then you have to start looking at the parameters of the wireless channel. Maybe you set your transmit power levels very low, therefore, no packets were going through. If you set it at 0.1 milliwatt, you find that nothing is going through and your distance between the base station and you set is like 2 kilometers or something like that. So, adding detail gives you more results, but you better know how to set those parameters, right. So, configuration of parameters becomes even more important when you start bringing in other systems together, because sometimes those systems are things that you did not write yourself, right. It would be fashionable to always go to NS2, get Vimax, combine them together and run it, but nobody really goes in actually or not nobody. People you have to go and actually start checking what those default values are and why results are sometimes not showing up, right. So, the different parameters will change the way that your output is going to be. And this we have experienced one, uh, right. Uh, practically with using opnet, which opnet is one of those paid commercial software that you pay you know, fairly large amount for. And uh, opnet has this entire stack from generating video traffic, we can generate video sources, you know voice, voice over IP, everything can be generated at great detail and then you can send the packets over the wireless channel, measure it and so on, right. But the number of bugs that are there, right, now this becomes a very large system. So, where simulation was supposed to be useful is now suddenly becoming a simple or regular or a software engineering assignment where there are too many subsystems that you do not know what is going on, right. And you are simply trying to guess based on the APIs what they would do. And without the source code, sometimes it is impossible to debug when failures take place. So, that is something that you have to watch for. But the nice thing is you can go to various levels of abstraction, right. You can even look at a CPU, you can simply say CPU is simply a my box, right. I can simply emulate CPU instructions that says add, just will just to add means I will emulate add as it is in the simulator. We have emulators today. Then you say no, no, I want to go one level further, I want to show even internally what the registers are like. Then you want to go further saying no, let us even look at add this caching, right. So, for memory simply I get data, I store data, you can even 
expand memory to its various levels, right? On secondary memory, main memory, cache, and different levels of cache, and so on. So, that is the good thing about simulation levels of abstraction, but it also comes with a cost that you better know, right? What happens at the different levels of abstraction? Okay. Anything else about simulation? So, I can also do very detailed performance monitoring, right? I can go into every node, I can look at since everything is programmed, right? I can go in and if you look at ARPANET, for example the number of metrics it gives you is mind boggling, right? it is a long list of metrics and sometimes they are also incorrect and we have to figure out why they are incorrect. So, like media for example, in voice calls there is something called mean opinion score that often it was giving us and the numbers made no sense. The calls are going through in the sense that the packets are getting delivered, but the MOS scores were very low right out of scale of 1 to 5 they were giving it as 3. three. Then we found that there is some mistake in the way it computes the mean opinion score. So, that is, but at least we have the option of digging into very, very fine levels of uh, performance, right. So, we can get uh, <coughs> fine grained performance metrics can be measured. So, so far we are saying all the good things about it, right. So, what are the bad things or negative things about using simulation? It is prone to coding errors. Lot of assumptions, we you make lot of assumptions. You will make some more, you will be the assumptions in the system will be more relaxed compared to mathematical modeling, but where the assumptions would fail is it might not really capture what goes on a real system. Real. So, because in real system there will be lot of other things happening, right? That that is you, do, you know you really cannot capture. For example, trying to measure some routing algorithm, right? In or some scheduling algorithm in the backbone, you never know what is going to be the instantaneous load on the backbone router, right? How many connections are coming in, and depending on that, your performance results will vary. So you still only have sort of representative set of results, right? Simulation again gives you only trends, but not real values. You cannot say in simulation I got two seconds as the delay, therefore in real life it should be two seconds. That is in right. That is too much of an extension. So the real life is not fully captured. Real life environment is not fully captured in the simulation. Simulation is a controlled environment. Lots of things are under our control. Pretty much everything is under our control, right? Whereas if you say that, for example, simple thing, virus channel modeling. You say I am modeling it with this fading channel, right? You have this nice set of equations. You put them in MATLAB, and then you go to the system and you find that measurements there are completely unrelated to what you thought, right? Where this where this model that you had uh, you know, uh, so hardly put together. Or put together so hard with great difficulty. So, there is the, the assumptions uh, right are better than what you would do in case of analysis, but they still do not capture reality, right. So, that is the one serious problem. Uh, what else? So, I said coding errors, right. So, if your, your system is prone to coding errors, and uh, many times I have seen my own student for the past 6 months, he has come to me with 4 or 5 sets of results, right, MS student, and each time. I found a coding error. I found that this is why, because the results were not matching what we expected, right. Some of the delays are not, some idle time measured is other microseconds, that is not true, it should be nanoseconds, and therefore something is wrong. So, we had to go back and revisit over and over again. So, you cannot really be satisfied that your code is actually working correctly or not, because there is so much randomness. If it is a sorting algorithm, you know, at the end of it, I can simply verify, right, run a check to say, okay, yes, this is indeed working correctly, no issues at all. Whereas, if it is a more complex analysis, a system that is being modeled, then you will never know whether the results are correct or not. Okay, if your system says delay is 3.52 milliseconds, so here is an implementation of a queuing system. It is something is how do I trust that it is indeed 3.52 milliseconds, right? So that's where you have to verify the code, verify the code, and also look for other ways to validate your code. One is to make sure that the numbers from simulation, your implementation is more or less accurate. At the same time, you need some other way to make sure that your values are correct, and that's where analysis comes in, right. So, you use math analysis as a way to substantiate your simulation results. So, many times you will see plots that compare simulation and analysis and then they should be close to each other. They will not be exactly the same, but at least the trend should be more or less close to each other, right. So, therefore, this still, right. So, your error, the issues are coding errors. And it does not capture. or real world whatever environments 
right and it is right how do we trust the results so for that we should validate with and this is again to some extent So, they serve a mutually right, beneficial purpose there. Math models can be verified by simulation and vice versa. Okay, well let us look at this queuing as an example, right. In queuing I, I simply do my Markov chain analysis and I use my birth path process and say delay equals 1 over mu minus lambda, right. That is what my math model tells. I implement this in a real system where I actually generate packets, where I am actually modeling the behavior of the system. Here only capturing, right, in the math model I am not really capturing that. Maybe in like, I mean if, even if you look at your viral channel models, right, your channel model is based on some formula that you use and says that at this point in time, right, this is the probability that this, you know bit will be flipped and so on, right. Uh, this will be the amount of noise in the system and therefore, there is a certain problem. We simply add noise and then do it, right, do a probability flip there and say whether a bit is that is, is going to be changed to 1 or 0 or vice versa. But whereas, we go to a real system in simulation also actually you are only going to do that. So, from math to simulation yes, in that case in some cases you are simply using the math model as is, but in some cases when you really go to measuring on the field then that is a totally different, right. There your noise is everything is not controlled by you at all. So, some parts of it yes, you are simply using the math model also in the simulation, where there is no cross validation possible. Only when you go to the real system right, you would know. So, in physics again you have a theory that says this is the way I expect the system should behave, then you have experiments that show that whether your model is correct or not and they keep very changing those models. So, so depending on which aspect of the system is modeled, if you are um, some parts of your simulation is also based on the math model of say channel or some other system, then yes the same errors will propagate, but where you can model elsewhere but actually implement here right in simulation then you will be able to differentiate. The third part is experimentation which I guess not much to say about you all know how difficult it is this is actually the hardest right. So, we say implementation. we use the term whatever test bed sometimes or right if it is a large scale system it is a small system implementation there are several terms. Sometimes people also say experimental results right where by experimental they mean that they actually built the system uh, different terms you would find right. We do experiments with everything is an experiment whether it is simulation or real life, but they would use the term experimental results or present in this paper which means actually they have built a system right and shown some results from that. <coughs> so, what is the, okay the what are the pros and cons of experimentation or implementation takes time. takes time right. Now, you have to worry about lot of details getting your system integrated getting all those header files put together all the packages working correctly. So, it is takes much longer to do implementation what else. Yes, so it will be effect operating in a real environment, right? Even that too, is sometimes you will never know, right? In the lab, you might be. I used to do this. Um, we had a system for uh, doing zip code recognition or pin code recognition, where in the lab everything worked beautifully, right? Because we are fed images, and then you take it out to the field trial where the sponsor USPS Postal Service was giving some images. The system crashed. It does. I mean, it should have not crashed. Simply, you said not given an answer. The system crashed, and I wrote the system. But anyway. Um, so, there is sometimes you are even in an experiment you are still doing a lab experiment right it is not exactly a real world experiment. So, whatever works well in the lab might not work well in the real world when you to say for web uh, server for example right web server in the lab you will be testing with all your local load it works perfectly the ones you open it out to the web system simply starts crashing for various reasons right incompatibilities or just functional uh, implementation errors and so on. Okay, but the, those are, but the, you need that. If you really want to take your product to your system to become a product, then you have to go into that, right. So, when it takes harder is definitely, right, more time consuming. So, most time consuming of these three is there. And the second is you would usually find that when you go to experiments, you will always try to implement 
really simpler simple algorithms right you leave all the complex algorithms complex mechanisms out because especially in prototypes when you go to a real system then you have to you know add all those bells and whistles <coughs> so that is uh, one from the uh, time and cost involved it is fairly high in terms of results is it more accurate or less accurate more accurate well actually it is probably as bad as simulation too you really can't say that you're because whatever errors are there in simulation right we think about coding errors in simulation coding errors can there be also in your system so your results here will be little bit more believable but you should not think that this is really accurate sometimes you'll find when as experiment that you know there are there will be a lot of variations in the measured results because of variations load variations in other background traffic or whatever it is right in the system so it is little bit more believable but i would not say that it is the most accurate right because all those errors still also propagate so but you generally it is more easy to sell a system with an implementation right if you had when google implemented the page rank algorithm they were probably able to show that see this works better than whatever searching algorithms out there and therefore you should try to market the system and so on right so <coughs> so but it definitely gives you much more insight into the system and behavior and so on and in terms of uh, results right when I, if i want to vary umpteen parameters i can do that very easily in my simulation environment right you, you that way will say okay vary all these n values try this for another 10 values and see what happens okay fine in simulation like because in simulation sometimes your time is constrained right i mean your um, you are simulating it for say 5 minutes of system time which is taking a few hours to run and so on so you can vary parameters at will in a simulated environment in a real environment you can but it's going to be even more time consuming so mostly you will find that in a simulated paper that we like you know simulation based paper uh, 20 30 graphs doesn't matter very very and get all those graphs put together you go to a, a test bed based paper you will find from one table that's all we measured it works here is the measurements i'm done right because it's finally shown to be working so usually it takes much more time to get more, lot more results out of the system but uh, you know it's just mostly a matter of time uh, <coughs> so that's why you do all the analysis with all the variables trying to figure out what are the factors affecting the system you find out which are the more important ones and you focus on that when you're trying to do the analysis with the experimentation you try to do that <coughs> okay so that is the True. Yes, yes. So it's almost like a feedback cycle that you have your model, you implement, and then you find that you have to go back and make change your assumptions too. Yes, you find that some of the traffic is no longer Poisson; it is some other distribution. Therefore, I have to go and change that to some other model. Yes. I am not saying the experimentation is is inaccurate, but you have to be watchful about even experimental results. That you should not trust that completely. You should use again. You should validate that with what your system tells you, with your other two systems tell you, right? If there is a big discrepancy, let's say in throughput or and so on, then either it is purely environment dependent, something in the environment which is not captured in those two models is what is causing it, or it may be there's something wrong with the implementation itself, right? So, it is there is not like a magical bullet that says okay one is better than the other, but all these three systems usually tend to be done together, or right? At least two of those should be there so that you have a good amount of faith if you are if you only have implementation then sometimes you may find that there are too many system based things right for example the amount of memory you give on your system if you're doing a, if you're doing it on a virtual box then you set your virtual box to have only 500 megabytes or so and then you run your testing on that 500 mb system and you say well this is this is very slow this algorithm is very bad you port it to a 4 gb system then suddenly that the system is better if you didn't think about that fact then you missed that right so you have to think about those also right what is the environment if there is anything in the environment that is causing the system to behave differently from how it behaved in the other two methods. Okay, so these are the three sort of high level description of the techniques. We will next uh, look at some of the common performance metrics and that will pretty much bring us to the end of uh, chapter 3. And then that is the end of all the introductory material, then we will start getting into random variables and so on next week. So commonly used performance metrics, right? <coughs> so when you think of uh, performance metrics for a system, you think about all the services that the system offers, whatever it is, delivering a packet, computing some, doing some computation, right? Something. And then the expected outcome for that, if you give, if it's a routing simulation, 
then your the user generates a packet gives it to the TCP layer. You expect that the network will write your TCP model simulation model says I will take care of all the necessary behavior that will deliver this packet to the end node which includes queuing intermediate routers you know, dequeuing and finally, getting delivered to the end node. So, you would talk about services and outcomes right. So, that is the first this we uh, when we listed the 10 things to do for uh, doing performance evaluation this is one of them right what are the services offered by the system and what are the expected outcomes of the services. So, this is more or less your requirement. So, you start here right. And in general the outcomes right for many cases is when you request a service either there are three possibilities when you request a service from a system right. And this is not only system level even subsystem level right some sub component also might be doing certain things. So, you will have to define right for each subsystem, each sub component some of these things. So, when a service is requested there are three things that can happen one it is done correctly, second it is done, but incorrectly. And third it is not done at all. your request was rejected for whatever reason. Now, this will make sense in some systems it would not make sense in some other. If you are talking about a sorting algorithm it will either sort or not sort there is no question of right uh, that the system did not get to the no? your system might crash if you give it a very large list of say 200 2 million entries the system crashed then that is an example of it did not get done right that is because there was a memory leak in your system. So, that is a functional issue there. From a network point of view it is related to capacity and errors and so on right. So, if I give a packet to a router either it forwards it or it does not forward it. If it does not forward it, it simply means that the packet got dropped right because the buffer got full. So, therefore, there are some capacity constraints that caused this to happen. So, what is the problem right or maybe the system itself if you look at it as uh, say web server right web server is sometimes you request a server right some uh, HTTP message is sent you expect a response back from the server. The server could either give you a response or the server could simply not respond at all because it is overwhelmed or it is down currently right. So, <coughs> but unlikely you will get a different web page if you go to a server right. So, it depends on the service that you have to look at and see which of these outcomes are possible, but in the case of a network accepting a packet you can deliver the packet correctly to the destination which is here part 1 or it could be delivered, but still because of errors right you might be delivering an incorrect packet to the destination that is possible right. Errors are introduced in here somewhere in the system some errors have happened right. <coughs> and the third is the router has simply dropped the packet. So, these are sort of three. So, depending on which of these happens we have again sub classification of metrics ok. <coughs> so, if a packet is indeed delivered correctly then we look at uh, sort of three metrics. Okay. So, I would say one a is delay or response time So, I made a request what is the response time of the system when did this request get satisfied. So, that is your first metric we know that the packet is very easy I sent it when did it get delivered I send a courier by for speed post when does it get delivered right. So, that is so this is um, a user specific metric right what did this user see what did I see in terms of response time. Then from the system perspective I would like to know how many packets per second am I able to deliver right that is representing the capacity of the system. So, that is usually throughput or rate. So, that is in some service requests per second right that is to capture. The third would be resource utilization the 
the resource could be many things, right? CPU, cycles consumed, memory, or you know, bandwidth consumed, etc. So during this, for example, I'm right sending several packets on a link. Utilization of the link is it 50 percent, 100 percent for the same load? If I'm able to use the resources less, then that is better, right? Or when I'm running a searching algorithm, sorting algorithm, if I use less memory, that is better. So you look at resource utilization as another way of capturing, right? So if you you might be able to get the same delay, same response time, or same throughput, right? But if one system uses less memory than the other, then that is better, right? So utilization of resources is less in this particular system. So that is what. So these three would happen whenever the service is being done correctly, right? The service is done. Therefore, I am more interested in one of these three. Um, of course, other character, other things are also possible. Variance of this, right? So these are the high-level metrics, and within this, we would say whether it is mean or mean plus variance and things like that. So that is the first category, right? Then the second category is when something gets done incorrectly. So a simple thing is packet gets delivered, but there are errors in the packet, right? Corrupted packet is being delivered. So we'd like to know, right? What is the well? I would say two a probability of error. And this uh, probability of error is easy. So if if you look at bit error rate, that is simply that metric, right? Bit error rate is simply what is the probability that a bit will get corrupted when it is sent on a link. Or packet error rate when a packet traverses multiple links, what happens? What is the effective packet error rate? So therefore, that is those are metrics that will capture the probability of error, right? And uh, sort of related to this, on some systems they also say what is the mean time to or mean time between or mean time to error, right? So this is will tell you how long the system will function typically, right? Correctly. Before errors take place, so let's say for if for 100 milliseconds there will be no errors, and then an error will take place. In every 100 milliseconds, there is an error. So this might be possible to compute, might not be possible to compute, but that is another way of looking at the system character of this uh, metric characterization. Mean time, mean time to time, that will be in the case of a system. Yes. Yeah. So if a system fails, so that it will usually come under reliability. Yeah. This is yeah. Mean time to repair is also there, but on a link that is kind of uh, not there. Uh, because these are transient errors, right? They kind of come and go. They are not fixable errors, right? <coughs> but if it's a system that uh, goes down, that would come under more availability of the system, right? The third part is when something is your requested is not at all done, right? <coughs> so not done can be in the case of networks. It is simple. What is the packet drop rate, right? How often does this happen? Or it could be something, uh, right? So this is uh, usually, you know, called as Speed reliability in the third category is availability. So availability depending on what system it is, right? The common metric that we would see is like the mean time to failure. This is true of machinery, where we say what is the mean time to failure, then the mean time to repair also comes in. But that is not the behavior of the system itself, right? That is like a separate process. The repairing process is independent. You simply take this machine off the shop and get it repaired elsewhere. Or in the case of uh, networks and so on, right? It is usually the packet loss rate, right? Is something that will capture the fraction of packets that are dropped. They're not serviced at all, right? This is loss, loss in the sense of dropped packets because buffers are full. It's not because of link errors. It's because the buffer was full. It was dropped by the system. Therefore, system load is very high, right? Or the system did some random. RED kind of algorithm which drops packets along the way. And then within each of these metrics, I can have mean, like I said, variance and all the moments that I want, right? But that is the high level. And then one more categorization of metrics is whether they are global versus local.
So, global matrix would be something for example, right and the, let us look at throughput uh, that is earlier example we saw there is an Aloha system or there is a router right that is sharing packets right that is uh, servicing packets on several queues. So, if I represent a queue like this right there are several users sending packets to this queue. This is the queue. So, packets are buffered here. So, that is a buffer that is your server packets are entering from different sources. Okay. So, as a global metric what can you think of global in the sense of system level I would say instead of global book queue system global system level metric what is system level metric the throughput right throughput utilization. So, from at this I can say how many packets per second are being delivered or being delivered by the server that is throughput and the second is utilization how often is the server being utilized right is it 10 percent 20 percent 50 percent and so on. So, those are system level metrics. Now, if you spend the money to install a server you want those to be high you want the throughput to be high because you are able to service more customers right. So, you want to put faster server you also mean they want to keep the server busy most of the time right because you are paying them paying this installing the server and so on. So, you want utilization to be very high. So, from that perspective I want to keep those two these two numbers is very high right throughput as well as utilization. But from the user perspective which is important delay right response time I do not care if others get serviced or not my packet should go through first I should be able to go people do that right you stand in line they always come in front of the line and just try to jump you right. So, that is the so therefore, they only care about response time. So, the users time is one thing is response time and the second is from a throughput perspective I want my fair share of throughput right. So, the fairness is also an important consideration. So, if I say that the system let us say had you know, three users we saw this in uh, networks right if the total throughput is 15 packets per second and user 1 had 13 and user 2 had 1 and user 3 had 1 right that is not fair. But system is very happy because it is able to service 15 packets per second system capacity is 18 packets per second system has been wonderfully serving everybody right or at least in terms of number of packets per second system has been able to uh, reach this to a very high number. But in terms of you look at fairness then it is not fair. So, there is disparity in the amount of service that has been given to the different customers. So, therefore, when you try to design a system you have to see which of these metrics you have to measure right. So, simply reporting total throughput will be misleading if there is this big discrepancy and this also happens sometimes in simulation sometimes you never pick a packet from a particular connection for different you had your some right metric to compute uh, and it is ended up not selecting a source at all in which case this is unfair. So, from the user perspective this is important system perspective this is important. So, you have to look at a system if this is not at all important to you it does not matter right if these are all VIP connections therefore, they will indeed get more connection that is different. But if you are interested in fairness then you should also measure these other metrics you should not simply stop with total throughput as the only metric of the system itself right ok. <coughs> mm, okay. Yeah. So, it depends upon the um, on the impact of those metrics on the system right. So, in the case of uh, packet delay mean is alone not adequate right you all probably know that because variance also matters variance in terms of range right what is the range of if I tell you that your packets are going to be having delays from 1 millisecond to 5 seconds right very long range in delays and you are watching a video and so on then your video caching or video buffering algorithm right has to buffer almost that much amount of right 5 seconds worth of data has to be buffered and therefore, it adversely affects your or if you do not have that kind of buffering then what happens is packets will start right you will have a packet then no packet for a long time another packet. So, your video will be very jumpy right. So, it really depends upon how it impacts the application and that is again coming from the intuition of the expert who is looking at the system. In some cases it really does not matter in some cases it would <coughs> indeed matter right. So, throughput if you look at uh, throughput of a user right measure over various points in time if that varies a lot if that could be like let us say over every 10 seconds I vary the measure the throughput and I always get 1 kbps right throughout those uh, 10 second interval then the user is does not care if it suddenly goes to 10 and comes down to 0.5 and so on the user might not if the user does not notice anything differently that the, the delay observed is does not vary as much then it does not really matter. So, usually for some metrics you look at um, the second third moments and so on, but most of the times we simply look at mean of course, not only mean uh, we will look at this much later on you can also look at your regular arithmetic mean or something like a geometric mean harmonic mean 
right all those things also come into play depending on which system it is sometimes some of these will make more sense then for example ratios comparison you might not want to do a simple arithmetic mean but uh, like a, uh, some other mean will be more useful or even mo median mode right all those things also remember from your basics of uh, probability right or statistics so um, so sometimes it is also median mode those are things that are harder to compute with the mathematical model but easier to compute with the simulation so it really depends on this